All right, it is Thursday, April 8th, and we are in downtown Orlando at our conference room, uh, and we're ready for tonight's Facebook Live. Uh, we do have a lot of good news for you, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to share them with you all today. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, we had three excuse me, four different green card approvals this week. So two of them had their green card interviews um, Tuesday and Wednesday, and we've already received notice that their cases were approved. So uh, we're really happy for our clients. These were marriage adjustments. The other approval was for a VAWA victim, which is a Violence Against the Women's Act, which we have spoken about at length before. So congratulations to our clients with all of those uh, great and successful um, outcomes. So we are ecstatic to you know, share that news with you all. Uh, one of these clients who became a citizen last month, uh, they went ahead and made a video testimonial for us uh, on, our, on our YouTube channel. And we've also shared it on our Instagram account. So if you wanna watch uh, your new citizen, your fellow new citizens uh, video testimonial, please do. And speaking of citizenship, that is what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, there's a lot of nuanced exceptions. There's a lot of requirements that sometimes people are not aware about when it comes to naturalization in order to become a U.S. citizen. So we will get to that in a second. I still have some important updates for you. So first and foremost, a friend of mine has reported to me that the immigration court has resumed its master calendar hearings. For many of our clients, these were getting canceled or postponed just a week before. And now they are going ahead and it sounds like today resuming. That's good news for a lot of clients who've been waiting for a hearing. Um, they are being set out to 2022 uh, for individual hearings. So we will be on the lookout with that. Hey, Mr. Bashar, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Another update that we have for you from immigration is that, you know, under the Trump administration, you were required to manually write in NA on any part of the application that didn't apply to you. And for a long time, they were even sending applications back. So, and what I mean by that, if you had a, a, an application where it says, do you have children and you put no, and then it has a space to leave children, well, you put no, so common sense would mean you don't have to list anything. But USCIS under the Trump administration was sending those applications back. They did release a memo um, about a week ago or an update to their policy that they will no longer be rejecting applications because of uh, blank space not being completed. So that is an important update that just happened on April 1st uh, last week. So be sure to check that out. We also have great news because we settled a longtime personal injury case yesterday. Our case manager, Kelly Dominguez, and I have been working on this car accident case for a long time. This, a couple issues happening in the personal injury world that I wanna share with you guys as far as how um, things are playing out. Well, most of the courts have been closed for a very long time. Hospitals have been extremely busy. This is important because this has caused extreme delays in a lot of people's cases. So for example, in order to make a demand with the insurance company, we need to have complete medical records complete. And a lot of these medical records are not being provided. So uh, this, uh, we've had to actually ask a couple clients to go in person to their medical provider in order to get the documents that we need. Now, a lot, how it works is we have a pre-suit cases and cases in litigation. And if you're in pre-suit, that simply means that we are working directly with the insurance company to try to negotiate a settlement. Well, if the negotiations don't go anywhere, the next course of action is typically filing a lawsuit in the circuit court. Once we file that lawsuit, a lot of times the case can get resolved and this will, this, my camera keeps going down, the case will get resolved and this will then lead to better negotiations. But now with the insurance companies, seeing that the courts are closed or having extreme delays, 
it's like another form of protection for them. So they've said, okay, you can file suit. Your case will be delayed instead of a year or two is now going to be delayed three or four years based on the backlog at the court dockets. So this is what's happening with a lot of personal injury cases and why there's delay, why it's hard to get a court date or hard to get proper um, feedback from an adjuster. But thankfully, uh, yesterday, one of our cases did settle and we were happy for that family and um, appreciate it. So you guys just remember that we do also handle personal injury. Uh, hey, Mr. Ahmed, thank you. Uh, no, appreciate the feedback. And then here's my sister, Rasha Mubarak. Um, you know, Rasha, my sister, is an activist and a consultant. So if you want to check out um, her company and um, see the good work that she does. Okay, next week, uh, we have actually our third Thursday uh, of the month, which means it's going to be time for our Arabic Facebook Live. And what's strange about April is there are actually five Thursdays this month. So after next week, Facebook Live, there'll be two more all in the month of April. Also next week, really important, is going to be the start of Ramadan. So uh, to all of those who are getting ready to uh, start to celebrate the holy month next month. And, um, you know, we will continue to do our Facebook Lives as much as possible during that 30-day period. Okay. So those are our updates. That's our good news. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, had several approvals this week and VAWAs. The immigration courts are starting to reopen. So we actually had master hearings today. Before that, it was only final hearings or individual hearings. So hopefully things are going to get back to normal as soon as possible. Florida has opened its vaccine line. So if you're over the age of 18, I believe anybody's eligible for a vaccine. So for those who are still waiting, please check that out. So today I mentioned that we're going to talk about naturalization. And if you see our client's testimonial video, uh, Uthman, he explained to us uh, what, how the process was for him at the interview and the process of working with our office. Uh, and now we have um, some updates for you and, and some questions that I'm going to go ahead and go through that we receive very often. So the first question we have is going to be on naturalization and how much does it cost to become a U.S. citizen? So we're not talking about attorney's fees here. The government fees right now are $725. Uh, you can apply for a fee waiver if you meet certain guidelines for that. But right now, the USCIS um, filing fee is $725. Naturalization requirements. So many of you know this, but uh, for the most part, have a green card or permanent resident card for five years. Uh, you must have been physically present in the United States for at least half that time in the aggregate over the last course five years. That basically means for two and a half years, you were physically present in the United States if you counted all the days together. Now, there's another residency requirement called uh, continuous residence. This tricks a lot of people and it causes a lot of confusion. Continuous residence simply means that you are residing in the United States, you haven't departed for a period of longer than six months, and you've maintained your ties. So uh, what happens if you have left the United States for a trip longer than six months? Well, technically speaking, you have now uh, the responsibility to rebut the presumption that you've broken your continuous residence. And you can do this by demonstrating the uh, that the circumstances were outside your control. For example, maybe COVID, maybe there was a family emergency or God forbid a death or somebody was sick. Those are all things that can be used to demonstrate why you stayed for too long. Now, if you're unable to convince the officer that you did not break your continuous residence and they believe they you did, typically speaking, you would have to wait four years and six months from that break in continuity before you can apply for your naturalization again. So that's the continuous residence, which is different than physical residence. Then finally, you must be a person of good, uh, not finally, there's a little bit more, a person of good moral character. 
basically five years preceding your application or the requisite period, three years if you're married to a US citizen and living with them. During that period, you cannot have, you know, typically negative conduct, uh, arrests, excessive speeding tickets, failing to pay your child support, failing to pay your alimony, this uh, failing to pay your taxes. These are all things that can come back and haunt you when you submit your application. It's not just speaking English or not being arrested. There's other things that they can look at in your application in order to determine whether or not you are a person of good moral character. Finally, you must then uh, demonstrate your knowledge of US civics and history and your ability to read English language and, uh, and understand it and write it. So these are the exams that people talk about. And earlier in the year, uh, we talked about the new exam, how much more difficult it was, but that has been since replaced. So we are still using, I believe, the 2008 version of the naturalization exam. So I do have a question from uh, Miss Safa Matar. Misik uh, Khair, Safa, how are you? Thanks for watching. Uh, Safa, that's a very important question. We tell people it depends, right? You can have an arrest and, you know, perhaps the case is dismissed. But what we need to do is look at the police report, look at the facts. The officer is going to request all of these things. If the police report is very descriptive and the evidence was kind of heavy against the individual, uh, you know, that the officer will have the discretion to determine whether or not you're a person of good moral character. Now, you have the opportunity to rebut it, to show what has happened, to show that it's been resolved. Perhaps somebody lied to the police when they made the report. Maybe they recanted their statement. All of these things can help when determining your uh, eligibility under good moral character. And this is, uh, you know, is, is, was an important thing because if you fail to disclose an arrest or certain history on your application at the time of the interview, if you do not correct it, the officer can then say that you've lied during the interview, you've misrepresented during the interview. So now, guess what? You will not have good moral character unless you appeal it, or uh, or if you don't, you have to wait five years. So this is uh, one of, it's a very important thing and why we always tell clients, disclose everything to us because we don't want the smallest mistakes to trip up somebody's application. All right, what else do we have here for questions? Okay. So, how long does it take? Naturalization is the processing times vary from district to district, right? I could tell you that Orlando is taking anywhere 10 to 14 months. Some cases it's a lot shorter. You know, um, how USCIS works is you make a filing at a remote lockbox where they accept the application. And then it's a lot of times for I-130s is dispersed to different processing offices. So in these offices, they they have different processing times. But I would say Orlando right now is around 10 to 14 months. Tampa is very similar. So that's how long the processing time takes. And you can check this out at USCIS.gov, check processing times. You can list the form and you can list the field center and where you live. And this is um, a good tool to kind of have an idea as to how long it's taking. Can attorney go with me to the naturalization interview? Yes, um, a lot. We go with most of our clients to the naturalization interview, but you have to understand the attorney's role is to make sure that your rights are not being infringed upon, that the officer is not violating your rights or abusing their power. Uh, it's ultimately your interview. Uh, it's ultimately your responsibility to prove that you meet these requirements. What we can do a lot of times is if there's a question of criminal history that's outside the five year scope or legal issues regarding the requirements, we absolutely can talk to the officer about it. But ultimately, answering the questions on the form, answering the test is still going to be on you, on the applicant. But I know for a lot of our clients, it just makes them feel good to know that we literally have them in uh, uh, that we are in the corner with them. 
So we have another good question here. What if I did not work and did not file taxes? Do I qualify? Well, there's a question on the N-400 that says, have you ever failed to file your tax returns? Okay. You would have to put yes. Even if you don't owe, you still have to file a tax return. You, everybody, even if you're not working, should be filing tax return and claiming zero amount income, whatever it is. So in our office, we're very conservative. We're going to go above and beyond and not try to put it to chance. We'll probably tell our clients, okay, you don't owe any taxes. You didn't work, but you still need to file your taxes. Better to be safe than sorry down the road. We don't want to have a different opinion than the USCIS officer and then either have to appeal or cause some type of delay. So um, that's how I answer at least that question when it comes to um, taxes. What happens if you fail the naturalization test? Well, at our office, uh, I'll have a practice with you. And if I feel like you're struggling, you better believe we're going to have a second practice test to make sure that you are ready for it. But sometimes things happen and people don't pass. Uh, you do get a second chance. Uh, USCIS will reschedule you for another interview, but a lot of times it can be several months before you have that opportunity. Special exemptions. So I want to talk about this for just a second. So we, and when we said the requirements early on in, in our tonight's live, we mentioned the five years as a legal resident and uh, three years if you're married and living in union with a U.S. citizen. There's exemptions to physical and continuous residency requirements for the following individuals. Like, so if you're a spouse of a US military personnel and you, they're stationed abroad, there are exemptions available for you. If you are the spouse of a US citizen and your husband or wife, for example, works for Microsoft in Dubai, you're never gonna accumulate the physical presence requirements or the continuous residence requirements if you're living with your husband or wife while they work for a US company abroad. So there's exemptions for the physical uh, and continuous residency under uh, 319 of the INA, and it is this is the exemption for it. So I really hope that you know we do have a lot of clients who are from the Middle East or Dubai, and there's a huge amount of uh, corporate American companies that they are working for, and their spouses may never be eligible under the normal rules. But with these exemption rules, we can sometimes make them eligible. And it's really nice because typically uh, the officers will then coordinate with us as far as scheduling the interview or which location, because they understand that the individual will need to book a ticket in order to come to their interview. You're still going to have an interview. You still have to sign a letter of intent to return to the U.S. once your spouse's employment is over. But it is a great tool for many of our clients. You know, So if you do know people who are living abroad or expats who have spouses living abroad it's a good tool that not everybody is aware of as far as this exemption for the physical and continuous residency so earlier i talked about continuous residency so this four year and one day rule for u.s citizenship so, so this is a this is wrong i put this here on purpose okay it's now four years and six months OK, so if you took a trip for longer than six months and you could not rebut the presumption that you've broken the continuous residency, then you must wait four years and six months in order to establish. So, I mean, you can check that out on USCIS's website directly. I know that that is there and available for you. We do um, now. There's some questions that I see that people asking. Um, if I'm a U.S. citizen, how long in the United States? Well, once you become a U.S. citizen, or if you were born a U.S. citizen, one of the beauty and the perks of being a citizen is there's no restriction really to come home. So you could go to London for five or ten years without ever coming home to the U.S. Now, I'm not an accountant, and after tax season, when some of our accountant friends are available, we will have an accountant on the show. But there are still some requirements as a U.S. citizen to file your taxes accordingly. Um, let me see what the next one. Can I travel during the naturalization process? This is a good question. Uh, if you are on the fence as far as having enough days in the United States 
or you know, not proving your residence might be in question, your continuous residence, maybe traveling is not a good idea for you. Okay, but that's something that you need to speak with your attorney about or double check your file to see if you have enough days or cushion in order to still qualify for naturalization, um, physical or continuous residency requirements. Now, if you haven't had a trip in five years and now your family is going on a reunion and it's two weeks long, you know, as long as there's no criminal history, uh, you can go on that trip. You will just amend your application at the interview. Now, why did I say about criminal history? There are some criminal convictions that can make you inadmissible to the United States, but are not removable, okay? So what that means basically is they won't remove you or just start deportation because of this criminal conviction. But if you leave the US, you're not gonna come back in or they're gonna put you in removal proceedings when you come back in and charge you as inadmissible. So please, please, please be careful before you um, travel and you have any type of criminal history. Uh, finally, one requirement to, for the naturalization as well is that you have to demonstrate that you have obtained your lawful permanent resident status through lawful means. So they may or may not ask you questions about the marriage that, you, that got you the green card or the asylum that got you the green card. So even if you got asylum 20 years ago, you better know your story and what happened to you and what you presented to the US government because they may present you with questions to see, did you obtain your residency through lawful means? And we saw this a lot the last few years. So make sure that if you have any type of interesting uh, history as to how you got your residency to share that with your attorney uh, when uh, before you file because this is an important thing to notate. That's um, something that I feel like people really don't realize sometimes and they rush when they file their naturalization and if they had a questionable or, 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 or muddy waters when they filed their green card in the first place, definitely want to consult with an attorney to make sure you're good to go. Now, just some general feedback on USCIS. When you go to your interviews now, they are doing same day ceremonies for those who are eligible. So if you pass your history test and your civics test and your background check is clean, more likely than not, they are going to swear you in that day, which is actually one nice silver lining that has come out of COVID. Instead of people waiting a month or two for an appointment, you can now become a citizen that same day. Now, it is still time of a pandemic. People are not sick all the time. Uh, and, and, this, and this is causing even USCIS employees to be out sick. So it's important to remember that the USCIS is staffed by human beings. And they are a lot of times working on, uh, you know, a smaller crew than normal, which has kind of led to the wait times being fairly long. Uh, for example, on, on Wednesday, we waited for 90 minutes, an hour and a half. The day before, we waited about 45 minutes. I always tell our clients that you, you must um, probably plan on two hours uh, as far as waiting to be called. There's some comments here. I'm going to go ahead and see uh, and address them here. What is the time taking after interviews to send green card? Thank you, Mr. Salama. Um, in some cases, we had cases approved within a day. So yesterday we went to an interview, the case was approved and the green card was sent. In other cases, if the uh, officer was not satisfied with the requirements or it's a more complex history, it can take them anywhere from 30 to 60 days, if not longer, to send a request for evidence in order to see what they're missing or what they're doing. So um, in a lot of cases, if we don't have an immediate approval, we'll usually wait about 60 to 90 days before we make an inquiry online to USCIS to see what's the status of the case. If after that inquiry, it's now been 100 days or 120 days, I know that sounds like a long time, four months, but 
uh, we would then send an inquiry directly to the Orlando supervisor asking what is the status of this case. What is the latest update on VAWA? Uh, Mr. Bashar, thank you for the question. There's no new changes on VAWA, so um, the law is still the same. VAWA applications do take uh, a really long time to adjudicate, um, in some cases more than two years. So uh, I am very happy for my client who received her VAWA. Good work to uh, Safa and myself. Pat myself on the back on that case. Uh, we are very happy for her and her family. So, um, but you know, these things take time. Uh, and I'm just remind everybody immigration uh, is a huge agency, USCIS. Processing times are high. We just came out of a pandemic, most offices are closed. We are doing what we can for the most part, and even sometimes so are the officers. So uh, I, we know that this is probably one of the most important, if not the most important part of your life, your immigration process. Uh, but please be patient with whoever is you're representing you and even with the officer. So we have another question. If my arrest overseas has to be disclosed, uh, I believe this is pertaining to naturalization. And yes, it does. The question is uh, very clear. It says, have you ever been arrested? Ever? Um, uh, and there's even a question that says, have you ever committed a crime for which you were not arrested? Which is uh, a, a complicated way of saying, do you admit to doing something that you never got caught for? Uh, so, the, but the arrests are disclosed. Now, that question is very interesting. There are you know, kind of famous cases that happened here in the US where somebody has been a citizen for 20 or 30 years, but they, they never disclosed that they were arrested. Then the US government finds out that they were arrested in another country 30 years ago. Then the US government will then seek to, you know, strip them of their citizenship because they obtained it by fraud or misrepresentation. So, Whatever, if you are, if you, and then if you disclose something on your green card application and not on your citizenship, they now have the abilities and are definitely cross checking and cross referencing all of your applications and all the technology databases. So, I mean, that leaves us, you know, as our wrapped up for our immigration again, uh, our updates and congratulations to our case manager, Kelly, for her settlement on the car accident case yesterday. Uh, we are just uh, happy that we have four or five uh, great things to share with you guys this week. We will see you next Thursday for our Facebook Live. I am going to confirm with Ms. Besma that she's okay to continue to do Facebook during Ramadan. I know for a lot of people, they have a lot of commitments between uh, family, prayer, and just having the energy to get through the fast so if you have any questions for us, uh, we did send out our newsletter last week and we did submit a poll of what you want to hear about. So we appreciate that so many of you have participated in that poll. So thank you for that. And we look forward to uh, addressing more of your questions. There's the church bells. It's time to go and we'll see you next week. Please remember to like, share and subscribe if you would be uh, so kind. And I hope everybody has a wonderful night and a great rest of the week.